Welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is going to be the usual recipe. Uh, we're going to have a 15-minute talk uh, by our speaker, followed by like roughly 10 minutes of official questions that go on the record. Uh, and then we're going to stick around for like 30 more minutes to chat a little more, get to do the, uh, the details, or ask the nastier questions. So stick around for that if uh, you're interested in the juicy bits. Uh, it's important that you keep uh, muted during the talk so we can hear uh, Gellert and there's, uh, there's no interference or anything. Uh, and if you have any questions, just type them here in the chat. We're going we're gonna to pick out the most interesting questions and ask them to the speaker. And the same goes for YouTube. So if you're watching, uh, you're following the stream on YouTube, then just type your questions in there. I'm going to try to channel some of those to the speaker. And, and I think that's everything. So I'm going to pass it over to Chalo, who's going to be introducing Gellert. Right, so it's it's my great pleasure to have uh, Galliot here, uh, whom I've known since quite a few years by now, and uh, he uh, finished his master's at Cambridge, and after that he joined DeepMind, and in DeepMind, shortly after, he started to work with our group, and, and also with me, and he broke into this uh, sphere of reinforcement learning theory, with a bunch of new papers. He started a PhD recently at, at UCL, and uh, he's just crashing it all. And so it's it's a great pleasure to have uh, Galliard talking today uh, here. Um, so Galliard, stage is yours. Cool, thank you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the wonderful introduction. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about TensorPan, which is a new flexible, scalable, and provably efficient local planner for huge MDPs. Uh, yeah, you can see the slides in the chat. Um, right, let's dive right in. Let's see. OK, this is our joint work with Chaba, Philip, Barnabash, Yasin, and Nan. And the link to the paper is right there. OK, so a little um, table of contents for today's talk. I will first introduce the setup, which is large-scale planning under linear realizability of Q star, which is the optimal action value function, or V star, uh, which is the optimal state value function. And then I will review some of the related uh, recent results here. And then we'll consider one of the, set, uh, the, the possible assumptions and look into why the approximate dynamic programming or bootstrapping kind of algorithms don't really work for that. And then I'll introduce a new method, which we'll learn a little bit differently. And this is called TensorPan. Uh, you'll see why. So stay tuned for that. OK, before we jump in, I just wanted to flash up this slide. This has a, a sort of a, a pure math C linear algebra riddle. Um, and I think, I think it's, it's beautifully simple. So I'm just, we're not going to talk about the, uh, the solution to this. But um, I just wanted to flash it up in case you get bored of me talking. You can always come back to this if you take a screenshot right now. Um, and, and of course, this was uh, not solved by me. This was solved by an amazingly talented mathematician called Barnabash here. Yeah, and uh, I think it's very rare to have some sort of a, a pure mathsy kind of uh, simple problem being the crux of, of such a, you know, like a, an, an RL kind of question. So, um, but you'll get, a, a, you'll get a bit of a, a spoiler in 20 minutes about this. Okay. Um, let's look in, uh, into the introduction, which is like what our markup decision process is and what is planning, and we'll set the, the problem up first. So a markup decision process, or MDP, is this tuple of uh, you know, a set of states, a set of actions, a set of probabilities for transitions, some rewards, and a horizon capital H. So we're in the finite uh, horizon episodic problem um, and so this kind of represents an environment in which um, you can learn how to act. So for each state, let's say there are S, capital S states, and this is a finite number. By the way, this assumption of the state set being finite is just for simplicity. All the results we present today uh, will uh, hold for infinite state spaces as well. Okay, so you have a state space, and in each state you can perform uh, one of the A many actions. And when you perform an action, you will be transported to a, a, a next state according to some uh, transition probabilities uh, that, that will be given by P of S and A for state S and action A. 
and you also observe a reward which uh, has an expectation. It's, it's stochastic, but it has an expectation of R of S and A. And there is also the assumption that these rewards will be bounded between 0 and 1. If you have a, a policy, which is uh, a mapping from states to transition probabilities, uh, distribution on, on the actions, then you can, you can calculate its value, which is the value uh, you know, of a policy is the expected reward we gather in H steps if we um, execute the, the policies according to the probabilities um, in, in the MDP and then get the, to the next state and, ex and you know, continue like that. Um, and this is actually if it, we're indexing things by, by lowercase h, which means that you know, in this case, we only have capital H steps. So if we've performed you know, three of those already, then the sum will go not to capital H, but capital H minus you know, whatever the lowercase h is. And so we're summing up the rewards, taking the expectations, and that is going to be the value of a policy. And then, of course, we have the, the V star, which is the, the optimum, you know, for, for the best policy, what is the value when we start from state S. And the objective is to find uh, a policy that is, you know, close to optimal, such that its value is going to be close to this V star. And, uh, and then we collect the, the highest possible amount of reward, at least in expectation. Um, but it, it turns out that to find this policy, it's actually enough to find the V star values themselves. Because if you know the V star values, of course, you can take the action that would maximize the reward plus the next state's V star values. And you can just act like that. And, and that will give you a policy that's optimal. So um, you know, it's kind of a central question to, to get the values of the, you know, the V star, which is the optimal state value function. Because um, then you basically know everything there is to know about the MVP. OK, um, to set up the local planning problem, here we have, in addition, access to features. So whenever you're in a state S, you also see the features corresponding to that state S. And this is a d-dimensional vector. And uh, what's important about this is this promise that um, the V star is going to be exactly equal to the inner product of some hidden secret weight vector theta star and the features for the state. And, and notice that the features depend on, on the state, but the features are given to us. However, the theta star does not depend on the state. And that means there's only d parameters to learn um, because these are d-dimensional vectors. And so that's uh, the, the, the hope here is, you know, you could have a lot of actions, even infinite, and if you didn't assume anything, you would have to kind of learn individually for all of them how to act in there. Um, but here, instead of that, we condense all of that down into d parameters. If you learn these d parameters, you know v star, and you know how to act optimally. And the hope is that you know you can you can kind of like uh, work in this MDP and figure out the d parameters in time that is polynomial in d. That's that's what we're shooting for, and we'll see if it's possible or not. Okay, uh, a couple more things. Like there's also the Bellman optimality equations, which is just this recursive equation that the V star needs to equal, you know, the best for the best possible action, the reward that you get, plus the expected next stage reward. And, and we're going to be using these Bellman equations um, a lot. So I just wanted to put that in here. Okay. Um, right. Okay. Okay. So you can see the local planning slide. Okay. Here I'm describing. The, the, the kind of learning setup and, and how we interact with the MDP. With online RL, what you'd have, it would be a little bit less permissive than this. What you would have is you'd have this black environment, and then the, each of the states would be fed into an agent, and the agent would have to give you an action, which is then performed in this environment. And uh, as I said, we're going to be a little bit more permissive here. We're going to allow, you know, when, when instead of agent, we're going to call this thing a planner. And we're going to allow this planner, when it receives a state, to go ahead and do a little bit of planning in, in the background. And, and, and after it's done the planning, it will give us an action. And so what is this planning? This, this planning is uh, basically this planner can go ahead and consult a simulator by giving it queries of the form of a state and an action. And the simulator will. Um, it will have a perfect simulation of the world, and it will give you back, it will give the, the planner back a possible transition in the form of the next state and the reward and the features. 
So it will, it will tell you what would have happened, what, what is one possibility of, of something that could have happened if you performed that action in that state. When we say local planning, what we mean is, um, in this case, um, you can only give it states and actions that you've seen so far. But in some cases, for negative results, we will in, we'll allow uh, you know, the, the, the planner to have a look at all the states and all the features. And the, the negative results I'm going to present will be stronger that way, because they'll be able to see all of those and, and still uh, will have a negative result. So that's just a little caveat there. But anyway, the point is um, the planner will do some queries of this form, and at some point it will decide to stop and output an action. And the expected number of times that it queries this, uh, the simulator, is called the query complexity. And that's going to be a central kind of quantity describing how good a planner is. So when, when it outputs an action, that action will be fed into this uh, environment and then performed, you know, and, and then there's a next state, and that next state will be fed into the planner. And so this is kind of an interconnection of a, of a, of a planner and, and an environment, an MDP. And so when we use the planner in this form, the policy that we end up implementing is, is going to be called the induced policy of the planner. So, so every planner kind of implicitly defines a policy, which is you know, the, the distribution of probability distribution of actions that will be performed in this closed loop form. And then we can ask the question of how good is this planner in the form of how good is the policy that it, it implicitly defines. And, um, and, and that is basically just the value of the policy of the planner. So what we want is this value to be close to optimal. That, that is what we want from the planner to be able to come up with actions that will give us a high reward and expectation. OK, um, there is a little bit of a comparison here with uh, model predictive control, where this, this, here, this illustration shows how to learn how to drive. Uh, it's kind of enough to plan only until, you know, from the current state, only as far as the, the green line goes. You try to not crash, you know, uh, locally and, and somehow you, you can you can put that together and, and drive you know in, a, in an okay way globally as well so that's kind of the idea of local planning why should you you know uh, plan everywhere and have to produce something that works everywhere if you could just look at where you are now and perf perform a little bit of computation there and then keep going that way and so that's kind of the idea of local planning Okay, um, here's the first slide with box there's going to be a lot of these what we want from the planner is we want generality. That means it should work with a lot of different kinds of MDPs. We want efficiency, which means it should have a, a low query complexity. And we also want effectiveness. That is, it should produce near optimal policies in terms of at least the value of the policy. So um, the crucial thing underpinning all of these is the assumptions that you make about the, the MDP. If you make assumptions that are too strong, you won't be able to apply this planner uh, very generally. So, so you lose that in generality. You may be able to come up with an effective and efficient planner, but you know, it won't be very general. Whereas if you, um, if, if you don't assume, if you, if you assume too little, you know, maybe you're going to be quite general, but there might, it might be impossible to come up with a planner that is both effective and efficient. And indeed, uh, you know, the recent results kind of carve out this cliff where if you assume uh, enough you will be able to have a, a planner that is polynomial in, in all the relevant parameters. But if you just assume a little bit less, you know, just, just a tiny bit less, or you change a little bit of caveat somewhere, then, uh, then right away you fall off this cliff. And it is provable that there isn't any planner out there, uh, any algorithm that could, that could solve this problem in an efficient and effective way. And uh, so I just wanted to highlight a couple of these results that, that have very similar assumptions, but, but very different outcomes. And, and the green outcomes here are you know, um, planners that are polynomial in the relevant parameters. And the, and the red uh, results are the negative results, where we say, uh, OK, um, there's a comment, which, yes, sorry. Uh, but but I'll, I'll just continue here that I, I'm going to just address these, these couple of um, relevant pieces of work. The first one is if you assume that the uh, q pi, which is the action value function for a policy pi, if that is realizable for all policies pi, then that means, um, you know, basically what we're saying here is if you take any policy 
and you take, uh, you know, with the same features, you will be able to find a theta for that policy, which makes it realizable. It's quite a strong assumption, but if you assume this and you're in planning, then you can use approximate policy uh, iteration and an optimal design to come up um, with a, a, a planner that is, is polynomial in all the relevant parameters. However, this assumption is quite strong. Like it would, it would say that uh, the features would uniformly cover all the different uh, cues that, that, you can, that you can get for all the policies. And if we go a little bit further than this and, and you know, try to uh, have a, a weaker assumption and, and only assume that for the optimal policy, Q star is going to be linearly realizable and you still have planning, um, then there's a negative result. And this says that, that you know, no algorithm will be polynomial. Um, one note here is that the number of actions is actually exponential, but, but, but the, you know, um, certainly the deep parameters you need to learn, despite all of this, you can't learn it in polynomial in the uh, steps. And, and I'll, I'll talk about this result a little bit more. But it seems that if you add another assumption here, which is a minimum gap assumption, then things are possible again. And so what is this minimum gap assumption? It basically says that in any state, if you perform the optimal action, then the value of that is going to be at least some constant larger than if you make a mistake and perform any suboptimal action. That is to say, there isn't two actions that are very close together in terms of value that you get for them. And if there is such a minimum gap assumption that it is at least you know, some constant or some parameter, I guess, uh, then you can then you can use bootstrapping and, and you'll be polynomial. However, that is only the case again if you're in planning. If you if you take the same problem in the online setting, I, I believe it was maybe three weeks ago or four weeks ago. I don't quite remember, but there was a talk given about this exact uh, setting and wh where there is again a, a negative result. And then and then another assumption that you can make is you assume that Q star and V star both of them are realizable linearly. And if you have planning and the features are given in advance, then again, you're going to be able to come up with a polynomial algorithm. However, if you are in the online setting and the features are given to you only locally, then again, you're, uh, it's impossible to come up with such an algorithm. So um, that is where, where kind of we come in the picture. We, we, what we assume in this work is that V star is linearly realizable and we add the extra assumption that the number of actions is small. So by small, I mean constant, like think two or three, just, just a small number of actions. Um, and if we have local planning with this, then, then we're going to, going to be able to have an efficient and effective planner. And so this is kind of what, uh, what, what the, the talk will be about, this, this, these kinds of assumptions here. Before I go into that, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how the minimum gap assumption works and you know, why certain things fail if you don't have that. So um, if you have this minimum gap assumption, which is again, like uh, you know, whenever you take a suboptimal action, you will lose out on, on some, at least some constant reward, let's say, um, that, that is, that is a, a way to phrase it. If you have this assumption, then what you can do, and if you have a generative model, which is a planner, planner setup where you can teleport to any state and perform any action, then what you can do is you can, and, and by the way, the features are given to you in advance. So what you can do is you can do the pre-computation of figuring out what, of, uh, going to the last stage and figuring out which features are the most important here, which actions have associated features that span the whole space the best. Uh, and this is called an optimal design. So you can come up with a small set that like spans everything. And then you can, you can basically try the states and actions for, for the corresponding, you know, you can try the corresponding states and actions. Uh, and what you will find is you will learn the Q star for those kinds of uh, features. And you will learn the Q star exactly because we're in the final stage and uh, the reward equals uh, the Q star in that final stage. I seem to be having a little bit of, of technical issues here, but... Uh, I mean, hopefully you can still see what's going on. I have indeed lost my slides. Uh, Did you see the slides? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I lost the, I lost the, um, so I was connected to a, another screen. Just, just one second, I'll, I'll try to connect back to it uh, and, and hopefully it will return because I can't go on to the next slide. Uh, okay. So this is a little bit annoying. 
That's fine. Uh, maybe in the meanwhile, if someone has a question, then yeah, yeah, yeah. Ask yeah. any yes, questions so. for the setup or. Yes, on the previous slide, you were distinguishing between planning and local planning. So, so what is the difference between those? Planning requires you to output a, an entire policy. And um, local yeah, so the, uh, it's, uh, it's more that if you, um, whether you're able to, to look um, for all the states and, and, and you know, think of all the set of states uh, and set of uh, features in that state, if you get that whole set, um, that is, is what I meant uh, by, by that kind of problem. But uh, but also I think it's more like uh, global access, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Global access. That is indeed what I meant. I think that would have been a little bit uh, a little bit more precise. You know what? I'm gonna open up this this slide deck again, and, and I'll see if I can uh, share my screen again because I think this yeah, is irrecoverably awesome. lost there. So I'll say stop sharing, and and I'll try this again. Hopefully this will work. I love how it like it waits. Just enough to to uh, to crash and then uh, and then oops. okay uh, okay so where were we here um, okay I'm back okay I can't see you now any anymore but um but uh but it's fine just just shout if you need something so where were we what we were saying is is we can, you can look at the final stage and you can look at the features there and you can sort of get the most important ones and then the queue starts there. And crucially, because of the minimum gap assumption, you know, any, any difference between a good action and a bad action will result in at least some loss of value. So even if you don't learn the values, the queue star values uh, exactly, you know, just, just learning it approximately allows you to snap onto the optimal actions, right? Like you can always identify which action is optimal if you're you know, some if you're if you're not too inaccurate, because there's always a, a minimum gap between them. So you can identify the optimal actions exactly, and that's kind of the crucial bit. When whenever I see a minimum gap assumption being used, it's used in this kind of way of 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 being able to snap, you know, approximate uh, learning to to like exactly optimal actions. And so what you can do if you have that is you can go back by by one stage and and you know. Again, I identify the most important features there and try them. And you can try them knowing that you know how to act optimally, exactly optimally, from the next state onwards. So then you can, you can apply uh, this, this sort of um, argument that you can always go back by one stage and learn about that stage because you know the, how to act optimally in the future stages. So that's, that's kind of how this works. Um, however, if you don't have this assumption, there there is a big problem that tends to happen, and 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 you know this happens to like this approximate dynamic programming kind of bootstrapping kind of algorithms that um, and what I mean by that is these are algorithms that will learn a point estimate of a value in a stage, and then they'll go back a pre to a previous stage, and they'll uh, you know just use those targets that uh, use those s targets that you learned in the previous stage. Okay, I'll I'll get rid of the dogs so so you can. Uh, uh, concentrate. Um, so basically what's happening here is if you learn that for the final stage, you learn the, the Q stars, because there's no minimum gap assumption, there's no snapping action happening now. Um, and that means when you go back to a previous stage, if you learn about the Q star there by using the values that you learned in, the, in, in, this, in this H, capital H stage, then the targets, you know, the values themselves that you're learning are going to be uh, inaccurate themselves, and it turns out this blows up the error exponentially. So as you as you go, you know, further towards the beginning of of the episode, uh, you will see that the the error in terms of how well you can learn things is going to increase exponentially. Okay, and this this kind of ties in with the negative result. I mean, the negative result. Uh, says that no no planner can solve this problem you know even if it uses something other than what i just described about bootstrapping and so what this is about is if you assume q star reliability um then you have the following but also i should say even this this would apply to v star reliability as well this isn't in the paper but if you think uh, you know whenever you perform an action with a certain features you know where the action a in a state s has some features then the, the state you're going to get into is going to have the same features. 
and that's and that's uh, and, and that is going to be the features of the V star. And this is the case because the construction here relies on a on a, a deterministic uh, transition. So the point is this: this works for V star reliability as well. And the and the result is that any sound planner sound planner is basically a planner that works well, you know, close to optimally to any for any MDP that satisfies the assumption of reliability. So any sound planner will have a worst case expected query complexity that's going to be at least um, exponential in, in at least the, the feature dimensionality D or the, or the horizon of the problem capital H. And this is kind of bad, right? Because the um, hope was at the beginning that you reduce the number of parameters to D and hopefully you can learn the parameters in polynomial time in D and then you're done because you know Q star or you know V star and you know how to act optimally. Are you, is everyone still with me, by the way? Because I can't. Yes, absolutely. But okay, everyone's with me. Okay. Um, so that's 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 a negative result, and and I think that the reason why it's interesting is is because it kind of highlights this fundamental problem with RL. I mean, RL is is just very hard, um, and and it is hard in ways that something like you know like bandits is is not as hard, because um, if you have bandits and you have some sort of a low dimensional linear structure such as this, there you can kind of do this optimal design business and, and figure out what things you want to try and then observe the targets and then and then calculate an average and have, have some sort of a statistical guarantee for that. But here, the targets are not really observed. You know, like the targets are Q star or V star, depending on the assumption. But you don't actually observe that. You only observe one transition. And to be able to know what the Q star or V star would have been, you would need to know how to act optimally from that point onwards. And this is kind of like a chicken and egg problem because, of course, the whole problem is that you don't know how to act from that point onwards. You, you're trying to learn that whole thing at the same time. And, and so it turns out this is hard even if you can teleport to any state. So the, the, the context of this negative result is that um, this, this is where you see all the features in advance and you see all the states and you can teleport anywhere and, and query the simulator for any state in any action. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, it's and, and you can do any amount of computation, and yet you won't be able to to uh, solve the MDP because there isn't enough information revealed to you, because the Q star and the V star and these things aren't actually revealed to you. So this is kind of the, the crux of it. Uh, it is not hard because it's hard to get to a, an interesting state, right? It is hard because you could teleport to any state that you deem interesting. Um, it is hard because, uh, you know, and, and by the way, that might be hard, you know, how to find, how to get somewhere. But that's not why it's hard. It's hard because you just don't observe the targets and the, what you observe has very low information. So here's the question then, like, if you don't observe these, then what do we actually observe? What is something that we can learn? And, and so this, um, this new method that I'm going to present will rely on a different kind of, of thing that, to learn. And this is going to be local consistency. And um, local, local consistency of the Bellman equation in particular. And the Bellman equation, uh, let's say you have a policy pi, which is deterministic. That means for a state S, it will give you action A deterministically. And so what, what holds for this is that the value of this policy in a state S will be exactly equal to the reward that you get by performing this action plus the expected value you will get from the next state onwards, right? This is just a fact, this, this equation holds. And so something about this equation will give you information. And so that's, that's the whole, um, I guess this is like the most important part of, of this method is, is that this is what we're going to learn about, not the Q star or V star, M you know, maybe indirectly we'll learn those too, but, but this is the, the, what's go what the information that we're going to use is, is just this Bellman equation and the consistency of it. Okay, so um, I'll present the theorem now. Um, there is this algorithm called TensorPlan. This is a planner such that for any MDP feature map pair, when you have the realizability of the V star and you have a, a bound, an L2 bound on the, on the features and also a bound on the, um, on the hidden weight vector, which is going to be known to the planner, capital B, then with a number of queries that is polynomial in this quantity, TensorPlan induces a delta optimal policy, which is to say the amount of reward 
uh, total reward that it's going to miss out on is, is going to be upper bounded by delta. So um, this polynomial, by the way, I mean, it, it has D and H and delta, as you would expect, but it does have the number of actions A in the exponent. So you might argue this is not a polynomial, um, but I argue it is a polynomial in the context of, of you know, the, the action count being super low. So, so remember I mentioned that that is the extra assumption we make. We only make it because of this. Like if you have two actions, you know, then this isn't, uh, that, then this is a polynomial. Or if you have three actions, it is a polynomial. But very quickly, uh, it, this will blow up. So this is a big caveat about this result that, that the A is in the exponent. Uh, you know, there is a question of, is this necessary? And uh, this is, as of yet, an, an open problem, but but like we hope to be able to to solve this soon, uh, and and you, uh, it, it is looking that it is you know that it will be exponential in a uh, necessarily. So um, another thing to note here is that this theorem can be strengthened a little bit with in terms of the guarantee that it has, um, and if you consider all the policies that are deterministic and realizable. With the features, that is to say, you're not just considering the optimal policy, and you're not just saying the optimal policy needs to be realizable. Maybe it isn't, but but maybe some other policy is realizable. And as long as that policy is deterministic, Tensor Plan will come up with the, it will induce a policy that will be able to compete with the best of these uh, realizable deterministic policies. So it will be up to delta worse than the best of them. Uh, also, some some extensions. One of them is that the results hold in the unrealizable case, where realizability holds approximately, um, but not but not exactly. And uh, it also holds in the discounted setting for discounted MDPs. So it's not just the the H horizon MDPs. Okay. Um, I think maybe this would be a good time to ask whether there's any questions that that are uh, that we need to look into first because now we're, I'm going to describe what the what the tensor pen does and if there's any burning questions maybe maybe I should take a little wow it's a big big fraction. that's very psychedelic yeah, yeah. Uh, should I should I carry on yes it's all very clear I think okay, yeah, maybe, okay. maybe I'm gonna ask about the previous slide so where you say where you had some s here in the second theorem. So how is s quantified? So s is the input to the algorithm. Um, so for realizability, when you have um, so okay, um, for realizability such as uh, such as let me see. Uh, actually, actually, all the s's are in terms of yeah. No, okay. So s is given to the the planner. So this is actually the uh, you remember the planner looks like this. And so basically, S is an input to the planner, and the, the, the uh, task of the planner is to come up with an action which is good in S. Right, I see. And then the guarantee says that and then, uh, and then, for and, this and then input by the S... way, then the next state will be fed into the planner as well. And the planner will be called for every single state along, the, along this, uh, this sort of uh, episode. And this is your, yeah, this is the guarantees here. And so what the guarantees say, this is for all S, um, for all S, if you give S to a tensor plan, then, then it will give a good reward. And, and the way this is phrased is that the policy that the tensor plan induces, which is the policy that you get uh, if you just give the, whichever state you're in, you give that to tensor plan, it will give you an action, you perform that action. If you execute this policy, then for each state, you'll be, um, the, the value will be near optimal. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 that does make sense. Yeah, maybe there. Yeah, it's it's. So yeah, it's over, I guess yeah. the short answer is that this is a for all. For all s right. in, yeah. in this in the state set, and and by the way, this holds even if the state set of states is, is infinite, and it holds you know exactly because tensor plan will always get the whichever state is is the input. Uh, so, so it will. Always yeah, I, I guess that. I guess what's sort of subtle about this is that the supremum over policies. If your set of policies does not include the optimal policy, then this is going to be achieved by a different policy in every state. And then I'm just wondering, like, what this guarantee actually means in the end. So, like, if I run this planning algorithm on the fly, then does this guarantee 
me any global guarantee on the sum of discounted rewards that I'm going to be getting or no. But that's that's probably a very technical question that that we should discuss. Yeah, no, I, I see the question. It's very interesting. I don't know if I can say anything off the top of my hat on that on on how. Um, but yes, you're right. It, it it will give you the the supremum for for any state. Uh, and and the feature, uh, policies themselves can be different, indeed. Yeah, I think this is very technical. Let's talk about this later. Cool, cool. Okay, uh, I'll just carry on then. Yes, so okay. to to basically to describe what TensorPlan does is uh, first I will say this is a generate and test kind of algorithm, and uh, there is going to be an outer loop that chooses some theta that uh, it hopes to be the real theta, and then it will do some sort of uh, experiments to see if it's true or not. And, and if not, then it will just choose another theta and so on. And so throughout this, it will maintain a set of plausible thetas, which th th this is basically the, the shaded green region here. These are the thetas that, uh, that, th th that are consistent with the experience so far that it has gathered. Right, so so whenever we see that some theta cannot be, whenever we we get enough evidence that some theta cannot be the real world model, the, the real parameter, um, then we can restrict this set to only include thetas that that this evidence wouldn't rule out, and so this this in this way we're shrinking this the set of, of plausible thetas, and whenever we start a new iteration, we choose a theta plus for that iteration optimistically. And so what I mean by that is, you know, whenever you uh, choose a theta, you will basically see all the values. You know, if that theta was true, then all the values would be just these inner products with the, with the features. So you choose optimistically, and that means you look at the state that you are supposed to be doing the planning from, that is the input state S. You look at its feature, and you, you choose the theta plus that has the highest inner product with that. So basically, the, the theta plus that um, promises you the highest reward. And so you choose that. And by the way, this is the only piece of optimism in this algorithm. Everything else, as you will see, won't, won't be optimistic about this. But this, this bit is, the, is where the optimism comes from. OK, and so when it chooses, after it chooses a theta plus, um, it, will st it will start you know, gathering information about whether this could be the true parameter or not. And so what it does is it will uh, execute this policy, that, you know, basically characterized by this theta. And what this does is it looks, it tries to find an action which is consistent with the Bellman equation. And so what that means is it will try all the actions and it will see whether this star equation holds for any of them. And if it does, it will take any action for which this holds. And so what this equation says is that the value predicted by this theta um, should be the same as the reward plus the expected next state value predicted by the theta. And so this must hold for the two theta, right? Because we, we are considering uh, deterministic policies that are realizable. That means for, for an action, you know, this for the action that the policy chooses, this must hold. So if, if this doesn't hold for any action, then, then like we know this is evidence that this theta isn't right. But if it holds for, for some action, then we can just um, we, we can just basically just just uh, perform that action. So in this case, uh, we, we're, we're checking two things actually. One of them is whether the value that is predicted by the theta plus is achieved by the policy that that I just described, which chooses consistent actions, and we check whether this consistency holds. But it turns out that the two are actually the same. Uh, and, and that is to say, if consistency holds, then you will get a guarantee. So B implies A. You will get a guarantee that the value predicted by theta plus is achieved by this policy. And why is that? It's, it's because if you consider this equation, what it says that um, any reduction in the next state expected value compared to this state's expected value will have to be offset by the reward that you get. And so you can. You can imagine that you could you could basically uh, use a telescoping argument and 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 do the same. You know, if, if this consistency holds forever, then uh, then I can I can plug in into here another equation like this, and in the end I will end up with the value of the the episode over, so value of capital H, 
which you know when when the episode is over it's it is defined as zero like there's no more value to be gained because it's it's over the episode is over so that means at some point this term will disappear and what you will have is just the sum of rewards and because consistency held throughout the value that is predicted is going to uh, equal the sum of rewards that you actually end up uh, gathering. So in this way, B implies A. So all you have to check is whether there is any consistent action in this sense. OK, wait, and wait, notice wait, that wait, we're I'm, not I'm, taking I'm a maximum. I'm confused yes? here. So, uh, so, so how is this pi of theta defined? Is it defined through a policy that is consistent, that picks an action such that this condi consistency condition holds? Actually, the, the, the like technical definition is it will take mm -hmm. the action which, ma which minimizes the discrepancy here. So if, if there is a consistent action, it will take that action. If, it, if there isn't, it will take something that is the least, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the most consistent. But, but the point is, well, if this happens, then, then it's basically a failure and we will update our set of, of thetas. So we'll, we'll, we'll basically break out at that point. We'll say, you know, this didn't work. But, but to give it a definition that actually is well defined, we'll say that it will take, um, it will take the, it will minimize this discrepancy between the left and the right hand side. I see. So basically, you just pick a theta plus, and then you check all the actions if this condition is satisfied. If there is such an action that this condition holds, then you say that you're good, then you proceed. If there's no such action, then you just then you just say that, okay, this theta plus was bad, and this is definitely exactly. not what I'm looking for. And you, exactly. you only do this locally for the state where you're in, like uh, at the input state to the plan. Wait, right? wait, can you, can you say that last so, bit? So, so do you only do this to the input state? Oh, no, you, you, you actually enroll entire episodes. OK. You know, you, you, try, you try to, because you want that. You want, because only then does the telescoping argument actually give you the sum of rewards along an episode. So you will basically play a couple of episodes with, mm -hmm. the, with this policy. Mm -hmm. And if a lot of those episodes work out to be consistent, mm -hmm. then you can mm -hmm. have statistical guarantees that the value of this policy is actually really what, what is predicted. And, and then okay. you're good. But if not, then you will fail. And so that's the idea. All right, OK. And then when checking this condition, I guess the challenge is that you cannot actually evaluate this expectation. And you need to draw like a bunch of samples. Yeah, yeah. And, and you, will, you, know, you will approximately evaluate it. Uh, but we'll get there soon, I guess. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. Because yeah, yeah. so far, I'm just as assuming that everything okay, is good. cool and everything Great. is nice. But but actually, there will be some approximation errors. But that that will be a, a separate slide. So yeah, right. Um, right. One, one thing I wanted to point out though is that we're not taking the action that maximizes the value according to this model, this theta. And then that's interesting. We're not we're not trying to maximize. We're not trying to be optimistic here anymore. We we're optimistic with the choice of theta plus. But here. We, you know, we take any action that is consistent. And that allows us to compete with policies that aren't the optimal policy. Like a policy might you know, choose some suboptimal action. But if that's the best one that is realized with the features, um, then, then, then it, will, you know, it will try to learn that one. So that's, that's kind of interesting. It, it, it would strengthen the results that way. Uh, the only source of optimism coming from, from this uh, first slide. OK, so another thing is, which I didn't yet talk about, is what happens if we fail. Well, if we fail, we just update the set of, of thetas that we consider to be ones where, where all of these equations that we've seen so far would not have failed. So basically, we take a, a theta that, in hindsight, would have fulfilled all the requirements that, that we observed so far. And so we will choose, again, optimistically and, and, and carry on like that. And so with this kind of an, arg uh, an argument, there's, there's two questions. One of them is if it finishes and, and outputs some policy, basically, if, if, you know, if this works for a long time, it will output the, the policy, this policy uh, with the theta plus. And, and if that is output, is it going to be a good policy? So that's the first question that we look into. And so uh, first point is that you have this two in one kind of thing. Remember, like B implies A. So that means all you have to check is, is local consistency, and you will get the value guarantees for free. That is, the value will be close to what is predicted by the theta. And also, when it stops, it will have found some theta for which the, the value of this, of this policy that it's been trying is in, the, in the, is, is in the span of the features. And also, because this theta was chosen optimistically, this value will have to be at least as large, or you know, approximately at least as large up to some uh, some maybe some some approximation error than the best possible. So this is how we can 
compete with any uh, you know, realizable deterministic policy. OK, so this is the why is it a good policy part. And then the next question is, why does it stop? You know, like there is this iteration, the, the, like, the situation here where you continuously shrink the set of thetas that you consider. The question is, how many iterations? And, and does it ever stop? And, and so uh, for, for this, let's look into what we're actually learning with each time step. And uh, for this, consider that v pi for some policy pi is realizable with the features. Uh, and and it, it is realizable with the hidden weight uh, vector theta. And, and let's say that this deterministic policy will give you action A in state S. And so what we know is, because of the Bellman equation, you know, this first line must hold. This, this is basically the local consistency line. This must hold. Um, but because of our assumptions, we can just plug into, into these values, we can plug in inner products, right, that with the features and, and, the, and the theta. So that is just using the assumption. And then in the third line, what we can do is um, we can concatenate the scalar R with the features that are d-dimensional. Basically, what we did here is we subtracted the left-hand side from the right-hand side. And then we have a scalar and we have some inner products. But we can put all of that into one inner product where we concatenate a scalar with some features and then on the right-hand side also concatenate the scalar one with some features. Um, and this, this inner product will equal zero. And, and we know this. Um, so this, this looks good, right? Because this is a D plus one dimensional space and it is some sort of an orthogonality result here. So you would think like maybe that reduces the dimensionality of the solution space by one. But the problem is it, it doesn't because we don't know which action would have been taken by pi of S. So we don't know A, right? Um, I mean, if, if we knew A, we would kind of know, you know what to do already. So that's kind of, again, the same chicken and egg problem. We don't know A, but what we do know is that for one of the actions, this condition will hold. And so we can multiply, if we call this, this big thing just delta of S and A, then we can multiply all these inner products for each of the actions, right? And, and because one of them is zero, the multiplication of all of them is also zero. So this is the first part of this. And, and, now, and now we have some sort of an expression where we don't need to know anything that we don't know. We, we, whenever we interact, we'll observe a condition like this, which must hold. And then the second part of this is that we can actually write a product of inner products as a big inner product of the tensor products of all the left-hand sides of the, of the inner products and all the tensor products of the right-hand side of the inner product. So I'll, I'll say that again. These two quantities are the same. And, and uh, what happens here is you take these uh, you know, left-hand sides and you take an A-fold tensor product of them, and you take the right-hand side and you, again, you take an A-fold tensor product. And these will be like two huge tensors. And if you consider these two tensors, if you flatten them and take an inner product, then that will be the same as the product of these inner products. And this is good because this quantity we know is zero. So this, this will give us an orthogonality result, kind of like in this case, you know, we had an orthogonality here, but we just didn't know A. Uh, here, we don't need to know A because we, we product everything with all the actions. But what we know is this, this uh, orthogonality holds, and this is orthogonality in a D plus one to the A dimensional linear space. And uh, so what TensorPlan can do is basically it can, it can check if this is orthogonal, if this is zero, then there will be a consistent action. So just take that action. But if it is not orthogonal, then it fails. That is the failure condition. And it can restrict the solution space to only consider thetas for which this orthogonality holds. And we know, you know, like every time this happens, the solution space is reduced by one dimension. And so therefore, maximum d plus one to the a times uh, can this happen. That's kind of the argument. Except, uh, you know, we, we didn't yet consider approximation error. So I'm going to talk about approximation error next, unless there's a, a burning question here. No, okay. it's very clear. Uh, what's that? Very clear. Okay. So, so um, recall the, the definition of this delta of S and A prime was this. Like it has rewards, expected rewards, expecting ne next state features, and so on and so forth. 
and we don't actually observe those. What we can observe is we can take a lot of these um, you know, samples, we can take a lot of these queries where a lot of the different realizations of the rewards are given to us. We can take averages of those, and that will give us uh, a tilde delta, which will be close to the delta. And so that will mean that this quantity here, this inner product, which used to be equal to zero, is now less than epsilon. For some epsilon that we can basically set, we can, you know, we can make this small, but it's never going to be zero. And, uh, and we also know because of the reward uh, boundedness, like every reward is bounded between zero and one, therefore all the values are bounded between zero and H, capital H, and therefore uh, there is a constant which bounds all the different inner products as well. So if you take the product of all of these, then it will turn out to be at most capital H to the A times epsilon. And you can think of this as a small number because you can set epsilon to be like super, super small that, that like offsets the capital H to the A. So this is a small number. It's not, again, it's not zero, but it's, it's small. So um, the argument is, is a little bit modified. If this condition is satisfied, then there will be an almost consistent action, which, you know, it's almost consistent. Uh, so there will be an extra error, but that extra error is actually controlled by epsilon. So it's small. We can set epsilon to small, and, you know, it's going to be uh, near zero. And if it is not satisfied, then we restrict the solution space, and we restrict it according to this equation here. Basically, for all the tilde deltas that this has failed, we will only consider thetas for which all of these conditions are small. So that's, that's the, the new solution space. So we restrict the solution space, and now the question is maximum how many times can we do that before uh, you know, we find the real theta necessarily. And because this isn't like equal to zero, like it's not like a super simple sort of linear algebra kind of argument, but instead we're going to use the eluder dimension kind of argument due to Rousseau and, and Von Roy. And, and this argument is, uh, well, just let, let's simplify it. Um, if you're given a set of possible functions, this is like a, a set of functions that you're given. And let's say the environment only has one. So there is a secret one function. And you're trying to find the values of that function everywhere. And the question is, how many points do you have to learn about? Do you have to learn the value? So like that, that, that secret function, you can learn its values by, by looking at some points. How many points do you have to look at it to be able to say its value everywhere? And so in this case, there is an illustration here. Let's say there is like you know, a set of possible functions. And we know that x1 is approximately this much, x2 is approximately this, x3, x4, this. Um, if, there is, if there are two functions in this set of functions, which take roughly the same values so far, take wildly different values somewhere else, then you can add this x5 to your sequence. And you can grow this sequence, you know, and, and every time you add a new value, there should be a function, there should be two functions in this function class that will agree with the values so far, approximately, but disagree with, uh, with, with, the, with the new value. So basically, this, this is uh, capturing this concept of how many values do you have to learn about before you learn the entire function. And this is called the eluder dimension, so, so the, the, the length of the longest sequence for which this is satisfied. And it turns out that the eluder dimension is, is very similar in this linear case to the, the actual dimension. And uh, in, in this case, the, the dimension, instead of d to the d plus 1 to the a, what we have here is order uh, auto d to the a times a plus uh, times some logarithmic terms. So it's very similar in a way. And so we use this kind of an argument to say that this red thing, this not satisfied thing, will only happen uh, at most some number of times. Because every time this happens, uh, you know, we would have taken a theta that agreed with all the values so far but disagrees with the real theta here. And that's the crucial bit. That's, that's basically the same kind of argument as in the eluder dimension. OK, um, there are two extensions, which I don't know if I have time for. I think, I think I'll just try to be uh, reasonably fast here. Um, so one extension is the near realizable case, where um, instead of this equality, so far, we had equality here. Instead, let's say they are close to each other up to some eta. And uh, what you can say here, all, all the results apply, basically. Um, all the guarantees apply here as well. 
And this is because for any policy pi for which this is true, you can construct an alternative MDP M prime, um, where the only difference between this M prime and the original MDP M is that the rewards are sh in, in state S and stage H are shifted by this Z of S and H amount. And this is going to be, you know, this quantity is, is carefully constructed in such a way that by definition, M prime will be exactly realizable with the same features. So this is just correcting for the, for the eta error, you know, by, by adding these rewards, these to the rewards. Um, and, and so we knew that tensor plan had to be resilient to some measurement noise. And that was, you know, the, the, basically the argument here that you don't observe everything exactly. So here, you know, if, if uh, you think that you're getting a simulator about M prime, which will give you R plus Z, but you're actually just getting R, you should be resilient to that as long as the Z is small. So this is the idea here that Z is, is going to be very small, uh, is, is going to be an absolute value of, uh, at most two eta. And this can be considered just noise. So tensor plan will hold, the guarantees uh, with respect to M prime will hold, even if the simulator is simulating M. So this also covers the case where the simulator isn't perfect. The simulator will make uh, some sort of a, a, you know, error as well itself. It's not a perfect simulator of the world, but the tensor plan guarantees still hold. So that means tensor plan is, is like almost optimal in M prime. And because M prime is so close to M, its values are also close. So that means it will also be uh, almost optimal uh, in, in M. And this is kind of the reduction style argument for, for this extension. And another extension is to the discounted case. Again, all the guarantees continue to hold. In the discounted case, instead of summing up age rewards, you have like a sum of a geometrically decreasing sort of uh, sequence of you know reward now plus gamma times reward next state, and then plus gamma squared reward two in the future state, and so on. For which you can also write the Bauman equation, but it it will be written in this way. So like it's going to be the expectation of the reward plus gamma times the next state. And so again, you can you can write the ex, uh, the non-exact but near re, uh, realizable case for this uh, like this, and then it turns out a similar reduction kind of argument works. You can set capital H to be the effective horizon beyond which the rewards don't really matter because they'll be multiplied by gamma to the H minus one. So it's going to be tiny no matter what happens. And then you can create an H horizon MDP M prime where the rewards and the features uh, of a stage H are multiplied by gamma to the H minus one. And if you think about it, it turns out that like any policy has a similar value in the original MDP M and this alternative H horizon M prime. And that's just because we like engineered into this the uh, discounting. So that means like the v value of the, of the discounted MDP for each policy is close to the value in the H horizon. And therefore the tensor plan guarantees, of course they hold for the H horizon problem. So it's going to be near optimal in, in M prime. Therefore it is going to be near optimal in M2 because the, you know, the values are all very similar. By the way, another point is this eta a caveat here in the previous slide, I forgot to mention that it, a theta, uh, eta has to be very small um, for, for this to work. So it's, it's like, you know, you, you can see how small, but the, the idea here is that you don't, like not everything breaks as soon as you don't have equations anymore. So that's just a, a little caveat here. And then to finish this off, I want to uh, just talk about a little implication of the positive and the negative results combined. Um, and, and the negative result in this, uh, what I'm talking about here is the, is the uh, Q star realizable, you know, a lot of actions and you get, you get the features and no planner exists that is efficient and, and effective. And, and as I said, it also holds for the V star realizability. So it seems that at least if you have the V star realizability and, and local planning, certainly the features for many action MVPs are not very useful. You still have to do an exponential amount of queries to solve the MDP. Uh, but on the other hand, the features for small action MDPs are useful uh, as, 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 as this uh, tensor plan uh, uh, shows. So that should mean that if you know if you can take any, any many action MDP and you can translate it into a, a small action MDP, 
Like if you have 100 actions, you know, you just say, uh, let's dial in those actions with binary choices. So you have like a, a deeper sort of um, you know, sequence of choosing this action. But basically, you can construct a, an MDP that works for all intents and purposes the same way as the many action MDP. Um, and, and because knowing the features for the small action MDP would give you polynomial um, query complexity, but knowing the features for the many action MDP would still be exponential, therefore, necessarily, learning these features would be hard for the small action MDP. And, and it would be as hard as solving the MDP itself. And this is kind of interesting because, you know, we, so far, we always assumed that you're given these features and we didn't look too much. I mean, I didn't look too much into how these features are, are being learned or given. I guess the question is first, like, would they even be useful? But it's interesting to see that in, in the case of a small action MDP, these features are so much more informative. They carry so much more information. And this is because of the local consistency. You know, it will hold for one action. Um, but if, if there is a small number of actions to choose from, that is a lot of information. If there is you know, an exponential number of actions to choose from, it is not a lot of information. So that's kind of an, an interesting little way to summarize what TensorPlan is doing. Uh, and another caveat, by the way, about TensorPlan is, uh, that I should mention before I forget, is this optimistic choice of theta plus. We don't actually know how to do that in a computationally efficient way. So we're talking about just uh, query complexity, the number of in interactions with the MDP, with the simulator. We're not talking about computational complexity. So that's just a, another caveat to, to mention. OK, um, I think, yeah, these are some references. Um, I think this is, this is what I wanted to say. So I'll, I'll uh, take some questions now. Are we on time? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very cool. much. Thank you. Cool. So, so does, yeah, it's a little bit of virtual clapping. Right, so I don't know. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, there was a there was a question that was actually answered during the talk uh, by by Amir Masood. Well, at least uh, he touched on it. Which is, is this update set of feasible thetas operation? Is this is this simple? Is is this trivial? I mean, I mean, looking at the formulas, it doesn't look trivial to me at all. Uh, so yeah, see, this in particular, is yeah, that is this check. So like, is this a convex set in the end? So what yeah, do you know no, about it's, this? It's like, so it's, yeah. it's some polynomial, uh, um, uh, what is it called now? Um, constraints. So it's, it's not, yeah, mm -hmm. no, we, we, we don't know. Uh, it's, this, this doesn't look very good. So uh, this, this is the, the computational issue here that it's kind mm -hmm. of hard to maximize. What you're trying to do is you, you take this set and you try to maximize the inner product of something from this set with the features of the state that you want to do planning in. That's the optimistic choice. And it's, it's, it doesn't look very promising. Right. And there's this product of this uh, theta vectors, a times with itself, and that, that probably makes it a non-convex set, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, right, and also the maximum. Um, if, if you ask whether you can represent this compactly, you can represent it compactly. So in that sense, the update of the set set is trivial because you just like collect this data and you updated the set. What's not trivial is the uh, optimistic calculation, right? That needs to happen afterwards. And for that, it would be useful if that that set was uh, had some nice structure, but uh, it's it's pretty ugly. Uh, you can also think about like doing everything in a higher dimensional space. Uh, and then you just have like lots of values to like an expanded version of this, but then you are over generating, and so that's that's not good either. So altogether, yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. So I guess my my biggest philosophical question here is uh, regarding this product that seems to give all this trouble in 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 the definition of the of the of this confidence set theta. So, so do you think that this taking the product of these uh, of these uh, values is this like a fundamental operation? Is this the right thing to do, or or have you considered other options as well? Um, yeah. So I, I guess what what I should mention here is that most of this applies. To, so this kind of algorithm that that works like this applies to cases. I, I'll, I'll answer this question in a little bit of a roundabout way. But point is, most of this 
um, applies to cases where you don't have linear function approximation. You just have some arbitrary function set. You know, you need to just have a way to update your your confidence set, right? Otherwise, it, it would apply if you just check local consistency. So the reason why we do this product is if you have um, this this linear these this linear sort of structure, um, then a, a way to talk about how quickly this this set shrinks is to is to multiply all these all these uh, things and and say that one of them is zero, so therefore close to zero, so you can use the eluder argument. So this is just a way to use the fact that this is a linear function class, and and uh, so that that's why. So uh, this is interchangeable if if you like, in case you had a different function class. The the idea is that you just take a, a you know the, the set of of functions among those that are consistent. You know that meaning that they always satisfy these local consistencies. Now the question of if you have linear uh, reliability. And you have the linear structure. If there is anything better than the than the product to be taken, um, the, the, the I, I guess this is a this isn't entirely uh, known yet. Like this is all the way going back to you know um, when I mentioned that this a in the exponent. We don't know if if that is is strictly necessary. Uh, it, it seems that if you take these products, you will certainly get that a there. Um, and and but but I, I don't I'm not very optimistic in terms of uh, whether we can remove a from the exponent mm -hmm. of, of any kind of upper bound. So, so one relatively obvious possible improvement that I can see, but may, maybe that's wrong, is that you know that actually the optimal policy also satisfies an inequality constraint, right? You know that the optimal policy satisfies, you know, v greater than Bellman operator times v, right? Yes, yes, so, yes. So would you be able to use this somehow? That's a, a, a very good insight. Um, I have been unable so far to to use that efficiently. Um, you know, if if you think about it, you, you basically get half spaces which either cut a lot or don't cut a lot, and uh, you know, it's it's kind of tricky. Whereas with the current arguments, you basically reduce the dimensionality by one every time. So that's um, that's where it's technically more difficult. But yes, th there could uh, be possibly be something to be said about these inequalities, at least if you consider optimal actions only. It just so happened that we couldn't find anything valuable in, in those inequalities. And what we find found to be uh, very valuable is these just, just these inequalities. Also, uh, and then, also for the, the optimality constraint, there is something funny about it, uh, in particular when you use it with optimism, right? Because uh, if you think about, uh, I guess, Gurgle is thinking about like something like v less than tv as appears and uh, the, the primal of uh, <laughs> LP for MDP. And in this case, uh, you actually get the upper convex hole of, uh, of V star, right? And in the original primal, like you have to add a main over V to actually get V star. Actually, otherwise you get something quite meaningless, right? So you can be, for example, you get at, at, at one level you can be this high and then X level, like you can just boost up V to like arbitrary high number and that will always be satisfied. But then if you do main or V, then you can do like optimistic at V at the same time. So there is a little bit of clash of that. Um, yeah, so um, so whenever you use like one-sided constraints, inequality constraints, you have to be very careful and find a way to impose uh, tightness by some other means. Uh, so it's just a little bit yeah. unclear when, when you do uh, for V less than mm -hmm. TV specifically, how do you impose tightness? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so I, I, I was just thinking that maybe this could be like an obvious way to like eliminate like huge numbers of thetas very quickly early on, but yeah, it's it's not so obvious at all. Yeah, yeah. Even after this very short discussion, I can see that. Uh, can I, I think I, I missed the part about um, the eluder dimension and also the approximation. I just zoned out. I, I was wondering if, if you could uh, go over that so I just kind of know what's sure. going on there. Yeah. Sure, okay, okay. The, um, I guess, I guess uh, just the, the gist is that we, uh, this, this slide just said that if you could see these deltas exactly, then this equality would hold exactly. 
this mm-hmm. delta is sort of the expected reward, expected next state and uh, features and, and so on. But you don't observe those exactly. You can take um, you can take some queries and you can take averages, but you will only observe this tilde delta, which is close to, you know, it's like the average reward is close to the real reward. The average expectation here is close to the real one. And therefore, mm-hmm. because you only observe that, you don't have equality zero, you have less than equal epsilon. And then, and then you can bound the, the the rest of the actions as well because of the value bounds. And then, you can, yeah. And then, and then, and then you have this constraint. And then here's where the eluder dimension comes in. Is basically like every time this is not satisfied, um, you will have another case where uh, th- there are two functions in the in the possible function in this function class of you know all the value functions that are realizable with the theta. You have two of them that agreed so far but disagree now. Right, because because now, like you know, the, the real theta will be small, uh, you know, in terms of it's it's being it has to be locally consistent, but the theta that you have now is not is is large because it's not consistent. So in this case, you have another point where things disagree, but everything before agreed. So that's the same thing as the eluder dimension, which just accounts. Oh, I see. I see. But so this tensor has no structure. I I should just think of it as a vector of. D to the A. Exactly. D plus one okay. to A. Yes. Uh, D plus one to A. Okay. okay. So it's just like linear, actually. Exactly. Yeah, it's just linear. So, Jason, yeah. also, uh, yeah. you're probably familiar with like, you know, using ellipsoid uh, potential to analyze this. There's an alternative proof that gives you the same result just using mm-hmm. standard mm-hmm. linear ellipsoid that works the same. So, there's nothing fancy here. It's and this about. isn't an uh, approximation error in the sense of misspecified. This is error because of. Um, Finite queries to simulator. Yes, but also the this is where uh, uh, you know you, you can plug in the approximation error into the oh, same okay. thing. In as this, well. you mm-hmm. handle in the same way. Okay. I yeah. See. So you just yeah yeah, yeah exactly. Got it. Okay, okay. Right. Estimation error. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I'm <laughs> Uh, okay. No, sorry. Just... I just wanted to, if, if you oh. didn't have this estimation error, so if, it, if you could compute these uh, ex- estimate in these uh, expectations exactly, then, then would you be able to solve this efficiently or? Um, uh, um, oh, yes, yes. There is uh, this paper called uh, Optimistic Constraint Propagation. Basically, the, the reason why you can solve things uh, v- way quicker polynomial in, in D and, and you don't need the action and the exponent, um, I believe, is, is because in, in the final stage, when you, when you make, so, so all the way back to this minimum gap sort of assumption here, um, it's like having a minimum gap assumption, right? Because you observe the final stage towards exactly, right? Um, I, I guess it's not exactly like a minimum gap assumption, of course, but, but because you observe these exactly, um, they will somehow give you um, they, they will give you exact constraints and reduce the dimensionality by one uh, of, of the d-dimensional space. Does that make sense? Like I'm not sure if I'm explaining this. Yeah, right. yeah I can. I guess you can eliminate more efficiently the, the possibilities. Uh, certainly, because of the, the final stage, right? If you look at the final stage, if you take an action, you will observe its value. Uh, so if if you if you imagine two star realizability, right? Then this would mean that I guess I guess uh, then the argument is is easier. If you have two star mm-hmm. realizability and you observe the value exactly, then you will observe it, literally what you observe is an inner product with the theta. So you, as long as you take linearly independent features, you know if you take if you take d many of them, um, then you're done, right? And you know mm-hmm. exactly what theta is because it's going to be a it, it's going to specify theta exactly. Mm-hmm. So the the, the yeah. kind of the trouble happens when uh, when these features are actually just small, small. and then overwhelms the um the the, the information that you, that you get. And and it seems yeah. there seems to be like this this big separation right but, uh, between this second line sort of ne- uh, negative results and the, the same case where you have. Uh, deterministic MDPs, for which that paper applies. You know, when you have Q star realizability and 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 exact, uh, you know, everything is exact because everything is deterministic. Mm-hmm. Thanks.
So regarding something that uh, you mentioned earlier, that uh, when we roll out the policy, we always check consistency. Uh, I forgot, did we think about what happens when you do max over there? I thought that it might also work. When, when you do max here? Uh, right. Um, is, is that what you mean? Yeah, when, when you grow out, like let's say you figure out a thing and when you, when you roll it out. And then there's a related thing is, is that an opportunity to, maybe I'm just uh, asking stupid questions, but is that an opportunity to get say, um, if we're actually realizing a pi that is not pi star, uh, you can imagine doing something like that. Like if the theta is actually like, you know, representing V pi, then if you take a max, you get automatically one step improvement. Right. Are we missing out that opportunity, or for some reason, Max just doesn't work here? Um, yeah. So, so what I think about that is, is certainly when you're checking for consistency, if you took the Max, um, that would be like then you wouldn't be able to compete with the with anything that isn't the optimal policy because that for the Max action, this doesn't necessarily have to be satisfied. Right, but I'm saying oh, but, but, the but, yeah, 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 no, but, but I, you can do consistency and rollouts like you know, it, exactly. Ways, so, right? so what? I, no, I, I, I understand the question. The question is, what, what if you take that as your consistency check, but actually when you unroll, right, uh, right. you use the max. max. And so, right. and so the, the flip side of this is if you, if you unroll a different kind of policy than what you checked consistency for, then you don't have this B implies A kind of thing, right? Because the, the reason why we can have a guarantee about the, the value of the, of, the, of the policy is because if the consistency holds, then, then you know, the, the value has to be good. But actually, right. if, if you take the max action, I don't know if we have any guarantees uh, that, that you can use that the value. But, but, see, see, but, but, but the, the thing is that I'm taking max, but I'm still, you know, I, I, I will still call it a break if there, there isn't any action that is consistent. I see. Now, okay, right? that, that sounds, you know, and that then whenever like, I take an action, I'm taking an action that sends me, presumably sends me to some better place. Um, Right, and there's always an action even later on to maintain that value. But again, I'm choosing something even better. And um, no, I think I think uh, I think this could work and, and give you. Sims could work, but but there is also some trivialty. Is like you know, if you really have a good policy, I mean, you can always invest a few more steps of uh, planning to to get a maybe improvement. But um, what I'm guessing is that we are can we essentially get that without additional levels of simulation. I see. Um, this is a very sure. good idea. I think, I think it might work because, um, <laughs> yeah, like you would basically be, I guess, I guess the final guarantee would still be that you're at least as good as the best linearly realizable policy, right? But, but if, but if but, but you can, that, no, but, but you can, you can uh, precisely define its one step improvement as in policy erasure, right? And try to, I'm not sure, like, but, but I think the best case scenario is that maybe you can compete with that. Because we're doing this in a very local manner, right? Whatever state we encounter in, we can do this thing. So that's kind of like L infinity sort of, uh, you know, we're improving over that policy everywhere. Uh, or maybe there's a kind of that we didn't notice, but uh, yeah, I wonder what happens um, if you take a max action, and no, actually, uh, I, I need to think about this a little more, I guess, before I... right, because because uh, if you take a max action, you will be throwing to like the very different states. But our procedure, the first step of our procedure, will take care of that and eliminates, you know, do the proper version space shrinking whatever states that you're going to visit. Yes. So I don't think that's a problem. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'll think about this. Yep. Too late to add to the paper, I guess. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be okay. uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess these questions are getting very technical now, so maybe we can stop recording. Uh, I guess that would make sense.